Good morning. Hey, Dark Knight Studio. Today is the 12th of September, Wednesday, 2018. This is the Nibbles IO daily programming stream. My name is Jeff. I write code every day. I stream it here on Twitch Monday through Friday. I continue to work on base code. Uh, yesterday I made some good progress, cleaning some things up, and then I had a <laughs> kind of an obvious thought um, on one of the refactorings I thought I needed to do. So I think that's actually going to end up being easier than expected. So that's what I was going to do this morning. <clears throat> um, um, I'm doing okay. I'm, I've got some kind of cold. <laughs> uh, my throat's killing me. Didn't sleep super well. But, hey, it is what it is. So, yesterday, I, after the stream, I refactored So, I used to be calling um, Scope Manager find identifier type. I wasn't going through the type identifier evaluator, excuse me, evaluator function. Um, so I refactored this to do everything that needs to be done in terms of um, getting a proper type ref. And that includes creating an unknown type if we can't find the type, um, and then cha I changed uh, all the call sites that used to be calling find identifier type directly. Now they just evaluate the, um, the type identifier node, which then ends up here, and then they get a type ref back. And then in... Um, Add identifier to scope. Um, well, first off, we're passing in the type reference pointer now. We're not passing in the type find result struct anymore. Um, <coughs> and if we have an initialization expression, but we didn't get a type ref, then we try to infer it like we always did. And that code pretty much stays the same. Otherwise, the type ref that comes in, we assign that to the identifier. If it's an unknown type, we add it to the identifiers with unknown types. Uh, this used to be inside of make unknown type from type plan result or whatever it's called. Um, but I had to pull it apart, <clears throat> um, which I think is better anyway, because there's only a handful of places where this is applicable. Um, and so that fixed. Uh, now the type identifier nodes from the AST, which have comments and have attributes on them, those are now flowing through the same uh, pipeline as everything else. So those comments show up, those attributes are being captured. Um, so that fixes that issue. The, <clears throat> the next thing that needs to be fixed, and really, so I've been pushing this one off because I just, I don't know. I, every time I got into it, I'm like, this doesn't seem right. And I wanted to come up with a better way to do it. And it only really applies to assignment. It doesn't apply 
to anything else uh, in the compiler. Um, so what's the issue? The issue is Um, okay, let's use this one as an example. <clears throat> this is creating a variable declaration. There is no assignment here. If I have a new variable and I assign it, <clears throat> this, so in that um, add new identifier to scope, we pull this apart to determine if it's a constant, um, how do I say this? Yeah, if the right hand side is constant, right? So if I, if I do this, B is equal to two. This can be done entirely through, because this is a global variable, if this were on the stack, different story. We're not quite there yet. Um, <clears throat> but because this is a global variable, um, the compiler can hoist this assignment essentially into memory. It can hoist it into one of the sections. In this case, it would be initialized data um, section. And <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we don't actually have to create any code. We don't have to emit any instructions to do this, okay? Um, because it's just a value. And <clears throat> if I had a constant value, right, it would be the same thing, right? So this definitely is going to get. Um, hoisted into a section, but assigning a constant value to B, even though this is a variable, we can, we can figure that out. <coughs> um, so as long as the right hand side is constant, then the assignment just becomes, if, if it's global, again, just becomes a memory thing. If it's not constant, uh, so if I do, you know, cast F32 2. Okay. So the cast operator here has to emit a convert instruction because the interpreter actually has to do something to turn this into a float, 32. <clears throat> Even if it's just internally a cast, it, it has to do something to do that conversion. It's not free. So this assignment, even though this is a constant value, this ends up becoming a, an instruction, a series of instructions. Um, so this <clears throat> assignment, because B is now being declared and assigned, this actually becomes two things. This becomes the identifier, which is B of type F32, which we get from the cast, and then, then the assignment. <clears throat> um, so if we come back here to the AST evaluator for the add new identifier to scope, we'll see down here where if we didn't have an initializer and we had an initialization exp uh, expression, because we only get an initializer if it's constant, um, <clears throat> then we need to make an actual binary operator, which is real code, to do the assignment we make a statement here, which is the no-no in this case, and we call add expression to scope. And what we really want to do here, we want to get rid of this part, right? And 
we want to have a, instead of returning an identifier here, we want to return some other element. So I think we want to add a new element to the model, like, I mean, we could just call it assignment. <clears throat> An assignment, that assignment element would have a list of element pointers in it. So then we could arbitrarily add as many other elements to an assignment as we need to make that assignment real. <clears throat> and then we're still returning one thing. We're no longer injecting a statement in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> so what's going to happen is um, these are going to roll up right into that one thing. And then if we look at this is um, add or no, this, yeah, this is add assignments to scope. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just calling this. So we actually almost, we need two, <coughs> we need two new elements, maybe, or maybe we could use the same type for both. Because um, here we could change add assignments to scope or passing in a, a list, which this is just a, an intermediate structure. It's not an element itself. <coughs> um, so instead of passing that, we could create a new assignment node here that has a list, an arbitrary list of other elements that it has. So we could pass that in. We don't need to do this anymore. We could just assign that new thing to the result because we're always going to give that one thing back. And then <clears throat> in here, you know, we would be adding either binary operators or assignments that come back from that identifier to scope, right? So I, we'd have an assignment that could have nested assignments. I don't know that I like that nomenclature. I'm trying to think of names that I like better. Um, but I think that's generally the idea of what we want to do here. And then that we're just refactoring a couple of these then because it's only this one case that needs to be able to return <clears throat> a multi-part thing, right? The rest of the DOM doesn't have, have this unique attribute. Um, <clears throat> And part of, there's two different things going on here. So I explained what's going on inside of add identifier to scope. In add assignments to scope, that's a little different. That has more to do with like multiple assignment or destructuring, depending on the terminology you want to use. So this would be more like, you know, uh, a comma B comma C is equal to, you know, 10, 12, 15, right? Um, theoretically, this should work. I don't, I think it, the parser parses it and turns it into something reasonable, but the compiler doesn't entirely handle this right now because of the code we just looked at. <clears throat> So by fixing these particular functions and the element that they generate, the compiler would then be 
producing something here that is, then this should theoretically work. Um, so, we have two different things, I guess. Although, again, sorta, right? Like it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, everything should be, this whole uh, thing is, is public, should be. <clears throat> if not, I can, I don't see any security or anything. <clears throat> mm. <clears throat> I don't usually get tied up on naming things too much. But every now and again, I run across something that is, uh, hey, blink out, Phil. Yeah, every now and again, I run across something like this, so. Difficult to name. So how about <clears throat> what we call this one a declaration because that's really kind of what it is and technically it's not an unbounded set, right? It's an identifier plus an optional binary operator is really what it is here. So yeah, let's do that. Let's call that declaration.
Looks pretty good.
see, look at that. They have a cache, obviously, I don't know. But there's like, I'm too fast. Yeah, see if I do it a second time, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm a, you know, things like that, whatever. I give them a pass. <clears throat> This is going to make a declaration now. We aren't going to do that anymore. Hey, Everett.
So the change I just made should fix a bug with labels <clears throat> so I can test that. Cool, I'll take a look. So this change won't really impact, or shouldn't impact, the line comments. Well, <laughs> unless I mess something up. Oh, right. <clears throat> this is now a declaration.
Okay. Oh, this must be short. Yeah, I'm running short. Okay, good. Hey. Uh, let's take a short. Uh, yep, all right. So now, I think it was inline assembly that was the one that was broken. And it was specifically this line, right? Um, because this is not a constant initialization here so <clears throat> this becomes two things so now this label should be in the right spot because I fixed this and we'll see <clears throat> This is, um, this handles all the different kinds of assignment, right? So this is related to the example that you're giving, um, constant assignment, the whole nine yards. Um, uh, no. I think green. Oh, um, crap. I got it up. the uh, the emit through <clears throat> to the assignment because now we'd have a statement that has an expression which would be a declaration which would have potentially a binary operator on it fixed it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So that problem is fixed. <laughs> the label is, this stuff's now rolling all the way up to statement where it should be and the labels being associated to the correct thing. <clears throat> so that's good. <laughs> that fixes that whole rigmarole. Um, so now, Yeah, let's call that one good and we'll review that. Because the next change is very similar, but oops. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of the same idea, but it is for a slightly different scenario.
<clears throat> the only question that I kind of left open on this particular refactoring is, so now we're getting back a declaration from add identifier to scope or declare identifier. Um, and in the, there's two spots. One, when we're defining fields for composite types, so like structures and stuff, and um, parameters for procedures, so return types and the actual parameters. I'm not, field right now does not have a um, pointer to the declaration. It just has a pointer to the identifier. And I'm kinda, I mean, it technically doesn't need the identifier, I don't, or the declaration, I don't think. Well, is that true though? I don't know if that's true. Yeah. So I think this probably needs to be refactored because If I, if I default initialize these to something, right? Um, especially if I have to cast it. Then that, there's, there's an initialization there. <clears throat> that's not constant. And the code that we just wrote, it's capturing all this, but field is throwing it away. So yeah, I think We can still leave a shortcut accessor on here for the identifier.
Hey, murder sweet. I'm doing okay. Yeah, this is C++.
So what I'm working on right now is I had refactored some code <clears throat> around um, uh, how fields record variables. Um, so what you're seeing me doing here is touching up some of the internal types. Um, Is there not a uh, no? Oh yeah, this one probably doesn't have a literal. Name Conqueror. 
Oh, it's emitting, um, that's not right. Why is you doing that? Okay, good. Now we're not getting extra stuff, but let's test. Short. Perfect. All right. That looks good. Okay. Good. All right. So now let's go back to looking at this. 
So I added a new element to the compiler DOM called declaration. And let's take a look at that real quick. A declaration has an identifier and an optional binary operator, which is the assignment operator. Um, although technically it could be, you know, really any, it, it's going to be an assignment, right? The right hand side could be anything really at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have a pretty standard accessors for on emit on the compiler side. We have to pass through to the assignment operator if it's there. And then the declaration owns the identifier and assignment pointer. <clears throat> so if this, what, what that means again, just as a refresher, is if we remove this element from the element map, then the identifier and assignment here will be freed as well. Uh, in the code DOM formatter, um, included the new declaration, added a case statement for it. Um, probably need to, actually, yes, I should fix that. So we draw edges to the identifier and the assignment if it's there. Okay, and then um, in element types, I added a forward declaration for declaration. Um, I added declaration to the element type and added it to the name map there for the types. Uh, in element builder, I created change make field to take a declaration instead of an identifier because now we're dealing in uh, declarations everywhere. I added a make declaration that takes the parent scope block, the identifier and assignment players, and include the header. And then here, you know, make field takes now a declaration pointer. We pass that through. And then make declaration, pretty straightforward. We create a new one, we put it in the element map, we set the parentage for the identifier and the assignment, and we return the new pointer. <clears throat> for directive, I had to include declaration, and now everything's kind of going through an extra layer of indirection. Um, so we have to get, this is going to be a declaration here in this case, um, because it's, a, it's an assignment, right? When you create foreign function declarations, it's an assignment. And we grab the identifier from in there, and um, I don't know why I was, casting that twice, and so I fixed that, just reusing the same variable. Um, and then this also needs to go through the declaration. Um, and then some of the aggregate built-in types, like any string, array, type info, they're building composite fields internally. Um, and now the API there is, it needs a declaration instead of just an identifier. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I had to go through and change these to call um, create declarate or make declaration. For fields, we take in a declaration now, not an identifier. Um, so I kind of push the identifier down one level um, and in the inline assembly test, I collapsed these two lines back into one line because this was part of the, this was one of the bugs I was trying to fix because labels were not getting associated to the correct statement because the way add identifier to scope was working was crap. So now it's working properly. 
and labels are going where they should. Uh, type info, this was just changing because of the API, string type, same thing. Program, um, because the structure has changed now, so like identifiers are essentially always owned now by, or almost always owned by a declaration. <clears throat> we need to go through that layer to see if there's a field in the path procedure type. Again, these are just, I had to add some includes because I had one header that was including other headers, which is evil, and I fixed that. Um, so these are just headers that needed to be included. And then in AST evaluator, <clears throat> um, add identifier to scope now returns a declaration. Declare identifier now returns a declaration and pull in the header file. And I had to, some, some of the casts are changing here. We're getting declarations now, not, not identifiers. So, so I changed some of the variable names. Uh, really, you know, add identifier to scope barely changed. I hoisted the pointer variable instead of having it be local here. I declare a null pointer variable there. We assign to it if we're going to make a binary operator. And then we just, we make the declaration as the very last step. So that was pretty easy. And then, yeah, these were just changes around. Like when we do the procedure definition, um, the return type, we're kind of cobbling together a specialized declaration in that case. Um, parameters for procedure types, um, those had to change. And then add assignments to scope change slightly here because of the API change and then declare identifier just returns a declaration pointer instead of an identifier pointer. And so for that set of changes, that's good. Um, Okay, so that's that one. That's really good.
Hey, cash override. Do you know a fast way to do if x is less than zero, x is equal to negative x without a condition? Um, I'm closing today. <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to think here. I guess. Well, the first question is what language, right? I'm, I'm assuming C, but yeah. Um, I mean, I can think of some ways to do it in assembly language. I, in C, I'm not thinking of anything that would be anywhere near standard off the top of my head. Well, in assembly, right, you could kind of cheat because depending on the CPU, right? Um, if you have a, <clears throat> depending on the CPU and how you get the value in of X, right? You may not need to do a compare. The flags would be set so that you could just look at the, you could just branch, right? Um, but again, this depends on um, the CPU and how you're getting the value of X. But yeah, you could probably, you know, sequence your code such that X gets loaded and the load of X impacts the flags implicitly. And then you could just do a branch. Um, but again, that's going to be some CPUs, that's going to be easier than others. Um, if, like, for example, on ARM, you would probably be able to do that fairly seamlessly. On x86, I don't know, I'd have to think about it, maybe. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, that would work. That's a two's compliment uh, <laughs> hack. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that one. Of course, in that situation, you're always paying the price to shift it, right? XOR it, shift it. I don't know. I don't know if that ends up being better or worse. Hard to say. Hey, Mr. Anderson. Do you think C++ will die off one day and C-sharp become standard? Uh, who knows, man. Um, I kind of doubt it, but if anything, it seems like right now, <clears throat> um, C-sharp seems to be kind of falling behind in terms of popularity, but I, I highly doubt C-sharp will. I highly doubt anything would really supplant C or C++ anytime soon, quite quite honestly. There's just way too much um, there's way too much legacy there. I need to take a really short break, get some more coffee. I'll be right back.
Okay, I am back. <clears throat> yeah, um, I was going to comment that what Cash Override is trying to do, like if you were making a game or you making something and it was for one particular family of CPU, like let's just say it was ARM and you know it was always going to be ARM, then it might make sense, right, to try to optimize that by hand, maybe. But if you have to be cross-platform, it starts to get much more complex. Not that you couldn't do it, couldn't create solutions for each CPU family, but Probably.
Why is it cheating? Steal from the best, right? <laughs> it's not like it's a test. There is no right answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, it worked. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this works. That's right. <laughs> it works. <clears throat> okay, good. So it reserved a word. This is the data, constant data for that, for the initialized data. So now let's go down and look at J. Do, 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 do. J. Yep, get the address, clear it, move four, do a zero extend, store it. Wow, nice. F, yeah. Okay, so then the question is, can I do K, J equal, well actually let's just do J, K equal K, J. Sign U sixteen two K so cast sixteen so wait. wait. What was the year? Cannot assign U sixteen to K. Right. Okay, so cast this to you.
Okay. J is reserved. K starts as eight. So here's the very first assignment for J. So there's that. Then we load the address of J. Ooh, that's not right. Why is it doing that? That's weird. Oh, this must be a um, this must be a bug in the variable type. One of the flags must not be must not be reset. Interesting. Okay, so this is not generating. <clears throat> correct code. Because this should be the. Well, and. Hmm. Yeah, this needs to be temporary. All right, so that's the code gen here is not correct, 100% correct, but I can fix that. That I can fix. What do I think of rest? <clears throat> well, I don't frequently think of oxidized metal. But... <laughs> oh, you mean the programming language. <laughs> um, I think rust is extremely complex is what I think. <clears throat> if I boil it down to one thought, that's what I walk away with when it comes to rust. Um, the rust is probably, if every language has a paradigm, then rust's paradigm is arguably ownership based programming and that is a paradigm that most programmers are not. It takes uh, an awful amount, it takes a lot of work to 
reorient your thinking to an ownership um, driven model. And, you know, we can argue whether or not that's right or not, whether or not that ends up yielding good software structure. But it does yield a very specific sort of structure in the end. And that may or may not be, that structure may or may not be the best in terms of being maintainable and understandable long term. So, <clears throat> and then you can delve into specific issues within that, right? The ergonomics of Rust are poor, in my opinion. Now, you know, they are working on these things, but it seems like just my passive observation of discussion forums and things in the Rust community, there's a lot of work to do there, and some of that could take a very long period of time. Um, I think, like most things in our industry, Rust somehow developed, which is ironic for its name, a shiny magic bullet appearance and the hype behind it sort of, I think, mesmerized a lot of people into thinking that it was an easier C or C++. <laughs> um, I think most folks who actually go to the extent of getting into Rust realize that's not the case <laughs> very quickly. Um, and yeah, I, I think, again, a lot of the promises, implicit or explicit, of Rust, the impression that I get observing other people discussing Rust is that there is a contingency of folks who believe that Rust guarantees that your code is perfect and flawless and safe and that you just have to write Rust code. And if you do that, then all the evils and sins of C and C++ are washed away and you know, you are an elevated programmer because you chose to use Rust. And that's true, maybe, if you do everything in one function and you never use an unsafe block or you never use an unsafe library, you know, unsafe crate, which by my reckoning, most crates wrap some other native thing, so they are unsafe. Um, so the end, right? So I said, if you write everything in one function, what, what I mean is if you don't end up having to have complex mutable state that has shared ownership that requires the RC or ref cell hack workaround, which then takes the compile time borrow checking behavior and moves it to runtime. So, and I, again, like most hype, right? Th this stuff is not explicitly spelled out as a disclaimer up front, right? It's the hype train continues unabated and then folks get into it and then realize it's not, it's not any better than C or C++. And in some ways, quite frankly, it's, it's going to hamper your productivity. Um, and again, we can have philosophical debates about whether or not 
you should be hampered, right? Like whether or not the fact that Rust digs its heels in and says, fuck you at every turn um, as you're working on something, uh, maybe we can argue that that's what compilers ought to be doing and they ought to be making you not hit your deadlines. <laughs> but the reality is, um, I, I don't think that's gonna fly, you know, pragmatically. Um, and if you write Rust long enough, yeah, you know, I would say realistically, probably, if you, if you have previous experience with C, C++, Pascal, anything that really lets you kind of do whatever you want, um, more or less, Rust is gonna be painful and it's gonna take time to get switched over to it. So I would say really minimum six months, probably realistically a year before you really could probably be equivalently effective, but that's not to say that you won't fall into snake pits and dragon, uh, dragon dens, you know, every other day, because as near as I can tell, even the best Rust programmers are constantly fighting with the borrow checker. So it's, yeah. It's a language. It compiles code. The compiler likes to tell you that you suck. So if you want to work in an environment like that, have fun. <laughs> Again, you know, if you like it, great. I mean, if you can be productive with it. I mean, there are people who are productive with mumps, right? I mean, there are people that, you know, are productive in all sorts of environments. But the reason people ask me this question is not because they are probably in the very small minority that could be or want to be productive with Rust. They're asking because they saw some shit on some site that hyped the f flying fuck out of it and made it sound like it was gonna turn them into, you know, whatever. Whatever the dream state is that people imagine when they hear about some new magical language. Um, and my general premise would be that those, pe those people are most likely not going to be in the small minority of folks who enjoy it, so. And I'm not saying that Rust is a bad language. What I'm saying is I think that people aren't prepared for the experience of what that language is. That's what I'm saying. I think Rust is fine if you know what you're getting into, and if you understand what the trade-offs are. But again, that's kind of, you either have to go through the gauntlet, get burned and understand what that is, or, you know, have already had the exposure Okay. Tell you what, man, you gotta have a little bit of a, you know, BDSM twist there to uh, want to have uh, the dominatrix that is Rust ruling over your day. <laughs>
No, slave. Psh. You cannot borrow there. Psh. Let's look at these. Okay, so I added another element called assignment to the compiler model. And assignment is really just a list of other element pointers. Um, this allows us to do this destructuring multi-assignment thing, uh, and that rolls up into this one element that fits in the rest of the model. Um, and then I had, so an AST evaluator, I include the assignment file. And then down here in the assignment evaluator function, we create an assignment. We pass the reference to the expressions, the element list from the assignment now, and those get aggregated up into that one element. So we don't have to return more than one element. We just aggregate them and then we return that one element. And I made some, um, well, I didn't make notes, but I for composite types and for procedures, I'm not, so like the multi-assignment won't work there properly. So I need to look at those kind of standalone. And I think I want to maybe refactor that code anyway um, but for now, um, a multiple assignment doesn't make any sense in the context of either a procedure or a, like a procedure parameter or a field in a composite type. But the only exception of that would be if you wanted to say like A comma B comma C colon, you know, U32, right? If you wanted to do it that way. 
I think I'll have to handle that case, but that's not technically multiple assignment. That's just multiple decor decoration. Um, so an element builder added make assignment. Pretty simple. Just creates the new assignment, puts it in the map, returns the pointer. Directive. Um, so for foreign functions, this is this is in fact an assignment. Um, and again, we, I guess we'll have to like I'll have to think about this. Uh, If um, probably what I should do here is I should just loop over, but I'll come back to that. For now, I'm just doing what the equivalent behavior was prior to this. I assume there's one declaration in there, and we go from there again. It would be pretty trivial to just hoist this into like a helper function and then just have a loop here that loops over um, the declarations in there and you're done, right? Um, same thing here, uh, should be pretty easy. And then theoretically, then you could do, you know, hash for in foo comma bar comma bing comma, you know, you could have multiple definitions if you wanted to. I don't know that I would ever use that syntax very frequently myself, but who knows, somebody else might. So, and then element types, I forward declared assignment, added the type, added the type to the name map, and in inline assembly, yeah, so I put this is kind of my first test, right? For assigning, doing multiple assignment, right? Does this work? This compiles the code gens off. I'm guessing there's a small logic error in here somewhere. Um, I just gotta look at that. And I think I can fix this fairly easily. Um, The issue here too is that like this assignment here is fine. This assignment is broken. I'm not sure exactly why. I'm gonna fi figure that out. But the other thing is like technically this needs to be uh, I guess you could say recursive or hierarchical. Like we need to dereference J, we need to get the address for J, then we need to do the K assignment, then we do the K, then we do the J assignment at the end. Right now, I think they're happening sequentially, like so this is assigning, this is getting assigned to that before this is getting assigned to that. So I just need to look at the implementation of that to see how that's I think I know where the issue's at I just got to step through it and think about how to solve it um, it should be pretty easy so that's that was a huge syntactical issue that had been kind of floating out there for a while um, very nice so that whole thing ended up being a lot easier to do than I was originally thinking it would be. I'm not going to say that's 
done quite yet. I want to fix the code generation and I want to double check the, um, for like uh, composite types and procedures and things, I want to double check like exactly how, how that's going to work. Like as an example here, let's, So this I think is going to error because this was trying to reassign to a constant. Yeah. Oh. Oh right. Got to use the directive. If I say A, B, C is U16, I'm guessing this isn't going to work. <clears throat> yeah, something's not, it's something's bailing somewhere. <laughs> so, so yeah, I gotta, I gotta fix this, right? Because this is a case that you would probably want. I'm guessing if I did this, it would be fine. Maybe, we'll see. That's okay. All right, so I'll have to figure that out. I knew there was probably gonna be an issue with that. So I gotta figure that out. Um, Then I just need to finish testing, like for all the different uh, structures, syntactical structures I've got. For now, I just need to test that I can get comments and attributes in the common cases that I want to support. So I think that's pretty close. So on and off today, I think I'm gonna work on these two and try to get them wrapped up. So all right, let's see if we can find someone to host. You're welcome.
<laughs> Street hustle. Ooh, our programming. Anybody have any uh, suggestions for a worthy channel? to walk. Now let's raid uh, live or dev trying. This stuff's usually pretty interesting. Okay, we're gonna raid this guy. He usually has some interesting stuff. He's working on a game in Unity. So I will be back online tomorrow, unless I feel even worse than I do today, <laughs> which could happen, you never know. But uh, yeah, I'm happy with the progress I made today. So we've got some long-standing bugs fixed. So that's good stuff. All right, here we go. See everybody tomorrow. Have a good one, bye.